uh, great friends uh, we are having uh, jason avishek knows him best so i have i requested avishek to introduce jason uh, today's speaker and he will introduce then he can start the seminar uh, avishek yeah. please yeah so hi everyone uh, uh, professor jason picardo is a faculty member in the chemical engineering department uh, so basically my colleague here who also works on turbulence he did his uh, phd at it madras uh, worked with professor pushpanam and after that he was a post doc at icts very work with uh, professor rama and uh, somebody sankarre and his in interest areas are in instability pattern formation uh, turbulent transport uh, polymers uh, about which he will talk today okay jason you can start i think right uh, yeah yeah okay so thanks avishek thanks mahendra uh, it's i'm very happy to be here presenting my work at this uh, in this seminar series uh, so today i'll be talking about uh, polymers in turbulence so there's of course lots of work that has been done on trying to understand how polymers get stretched out in a turbulent flow and how they uh, react back and modify the flow and reduce drag and so on uh, but today i'll be focusing on a slightly different aspect which is how when these polymers are stretched they can actually undergo mechanical breakup so the flow literally pulls the polymer apart and as a consequence these polymers degrade over time and uh, when this happens you know the all the nice properties of polymer solutions are also lost so that's what i'll try to talk about today and uh, uh, through simulations and also try and compare with uh, some experiments so uh, this work has been done in collaboration with uh, dario vicenzi at uh, nice in france uh, shamridhi at icts who gave a talk uh, in this series i think a few weeks uh, back and uh, takeshi uh, watanabe at uh, at nit in japan and i'm grateful for funding from the iit bombay seeker okay so uh, let's start with uh, maybe looking at some experiments uh, which have first seen scission and you know try and appreciate why this is something that we should worry about so as i mentioned when you have polymers in a flow the uh, gradients in the flow exert a drag force on the polymer molecule and stretch it out and that polymer that stretched polymer when it reacts back onto the flow uh, modifies the structures of the flow and uh, ultimately leads to uh, drag reduction right so for example in flow through a pipe the uh, pressure loss is reduced or if you have um, a, a mixing tank then the for the work done to stir the fluid reduces and so on uh but the flip side of this is that when this polymer stretched right if it stretched beyond a certain threshold it can actually break up what we call a uh, scission and when that happens you are left with two smaller polymer fragments that can stretch less by a corresponding amount and if this process is repeated ultimately you are left with just tiny fra polymer fragments which stretch no longer and you lose the drag reduction effect so an early experiment which shows this very nicely is this uh, experiment by musa and coworkers in uh, 93 so you'll see the experimental knowledge of this phenomena uh, is well ahead of any any modeling work which is why i'm interested in this also so you see here they have done classic uh, pressure drop measurements and computed the friction factor as a function of the reynolds number and the line on top here is your newtonian uh, turbulence result right and uh, you see that they have got two different solvents the same polymer i forget the polymer exactly and what you see is that uh, at some initial earlier reynolds numbers you uh, are close to works maximum drag reduction as imported so basically by adding polymers you have reduced the drag or reduced the friction factor almost down to the asymptotic maximum theoretical level and then with reynolds number this you continue to follow the asymptote but after some reynolds number right so remember when you're increasing the reynolds number you're actually increasing the velocity gradients within the flow and the extent to which the polymer can be stretched so beyond a certain reynolds number you start seeing a loss of the drag reduction effect or the friction factor starts coming going back up to the newtonian level uh, and this loss is delayed at higher concentrations but eventually you see the same behavior and uh, this really is happening because the polymer start breaking up beyond a certain reynolds number and uh, as they if any sufficiently and if a sufficient number of them break up uh, there's nothing left to stretch and react back on the flow and you lose the drag reduction so this is a experiment which is of course uh, i mean there's a fixed residence time 
So you put in fresh polymer, it goes to the pipe, and then you start with fresh polymer, goes to the pipe, and so on. But a different sort of experiment, which is uh, which where you can actually track how the polymers break up in time, and something that is closer in spirit to the simulations I will show you, is this double gap uh, kind of the geometry experiment okay so what you do is you have a fixed volume of fluid here and then you have this sort of inner cylindrical shell that is rotated with a motor and you can measure the so what they do is this experiment is by suarez's group and he has done quite a bit of work uh, on this topic of scission so the idea is you apply a you apply a fixed torque to this motor and you measure the angular rotation and so if you have uh, if you put polymer inside the drag is reduced and so the more, the angular rotation speed picks up for the same torque right it increases so you can monitor this omega versus time and what you'll see is after an initial uh, after the flow develops and you have an initial amount of drag reduction that gets lost as polymers break up so that's exactly what you see here for different Reynolds numbers here it's uh, peo the polymer so you see, for all Reynolds numbers, it takes a little while for the flow structures to develop, and it, then it reaches its sort of maximum drag reduction. And you would have expected it to stay there because things are stationary, one might think. But what really happens is after a while, the polymers start to break up, and the breakup catches up with the phenomena, and then you lose the drag reduction. So this is really the kind of thing that we want to understand. Uh, how are the polymers breaking up in the flow, and how does it uh, cause this loss of drag reduction? Okay, so that was kind of motivation from experiments. And of course, as you can see that, you know, all applications of this phenomena are going to be limited by the fact that these polymers are going to break. Okay, so keep setting that aside for a second. Uh, the other in, uh, kind of interest uh, derives from the fact that it's an interesting, uh, challenging scientific problem and really requires one to understand both the polymer dynamics and the flow. Uh, so if you look at the past work on uh, scission of polymers induced by flow, there's a lot of work done in lamina extensional flows, right? So the kind of picture I'm showing you here, where you put a polymer inside a cross slot, for example, and you have pure extensional flow stretching out the polymer. So these things have been studied well with Brownian dynamic simulations compared with experiments, etc. So one uh, uh, important paper is here in the, by the group of Suresh Kumar. So this thing is relatively well understood. Uh, but when we come to turbulent flows, the situation is quite different. Uh, there are quite a few experiments. I showed you two of them in the past two slides, uh, but there are almost no models and uh, no attempt to compare with experiments so far. And there's in fact a recent editorial in the Journal of Non-Newtonian Fluid Mechanics by Suarez, which highlights the importance of this problem and the dearth of uh, modeling efforts, especially in turbulent flows. So th there's one sort of uh, the first work that tries to model scission is based on a phenomenological continuum model. Uh, that's again by Suarez's group, but it suffers some difficulties. So you see here, they have done it. Basically, they've done a simulation of a quiet flow. This is in fact their picture. And uh, what, they, what they do is they try to, um, along with the usual, uh, they have a FNAP model. So they have the Navier-Stokes that is appended with the uh, equation for the polymer conformation tensor. And along with that, they have a scalar field representing the length of the polymer or the maximum length. And they make this a field and they, you know, kind of artificially put in a uh, rate of loss of this uh, length. So they assume that breakup leads to loss of the maximum length. So that's shown in this blue curve that is sort of put in by hand. And they kind of see what is the consequence of that for drag reduction. Uh, so while they do see a sort of decrease of drag reduction after some time, they then get these artificial oscillations. And this is purely a numerical artifact and is probably due to the fact that this kind of uh, phenomenological model is not based on you know, any microscopic or first principles. So there is really need to understand what's happening at the individual polymer level, how the polymer is breaking up and uh, how this scales with the Reynolds number, et cetera. And from there, try to build up back to the continuum scale. Uh, by the way, uh, another reason why this sort of approach may not work is because uh, the, the real, I mean, the issue with the polymer breaking up into smaller lengths is that the smaller fragments 
are harder to stretch out right so in some sense the elastic time scale of a polymer reduces uh, or it the spring let's say effective spring inside that polymer becomes stiffer as it breaks up to smaller sizes and so that involves that requires one to understand how the time scale associated with the polymer molecules is changing as they break and that's not there in this uh, model right now in this work okay so what we want to do and what i'll be talking about today is we will try to combine brownian dynamic simulations for individual polymer molecules with dns for the flow and uh, use that to understand how scission proceeds at the individual molecule scale the benefit of this is i can then impose scission in a in a direct way inside the model right i don't have to do any phenomenological stuff i can just say that if the polymer molecule stretches beyond the threshold it can break or equivalently if the force exerted on the polymer exceeds the threshold i can break it at that corresponding location so in that sense it is a precise way to model the phenomena of course within the world of my simulation all right so uh, with that uh, uh, i'll talk to you about basically three levels of work that we have done so far Uh, so first we'll start with passive polymers by that i mean we look at very dilute suspension where polymers don't see each other and there's only one way interaction so only the flow affects the polymer we ignore the feedback uh, at this initial stage of work so and moreover we only look at the first scission that's like the first phase of the study so you imagine that you have this kind of polymer molecule and uh, we account for the first breakup event so you know uh, how much time does it take for it to break up the first time what are the statistics of that event that's what i'll talk about first uh, then i'll take it a step further and talk about what happens if this uh, if these two daughter fragments are allowed to remain in the flow and you know are allowed to undergo subsequent breakups so how those events differ from the original first scission and you know what kind of uh, final distribution of polymers you can get whether you can predict this uh, ultimate distribution and then finally at the end of my talk i'll talk about how accounting for the feedback of polymers onto the flow right and then then that will allow us to make some predictions about the loss of drag reduction okay so let's start with the models both for the polymer and for the flow so for the polymer we'll use the bead spring uh, fini model Right, which has uh, been widely used in, especially in rheum, uh, rheological studies, and also uh, to some extent in, uh, to a limited extent, but there are studies in DNS, of course. Uh, so this is the model. So the first equation is just the motion of the center of mass. Uh, so basically, the model is a bunch of beads that are connected with uh, uh, finitely extensible springs. Right, this is the force law. Uh, on the spring is modulated by this kind of factor that enforces the maximum uh, stretch length so q is the extension of any individual link qm is the maximum to which it can stretch so this is like a nonlinear spring law that comes in and uh, each of the beads feels the flow the springs are just there to give me the elastic recoil okay so the the flow doesn't see the spring the flow just sees the beads and the beads feel the flow so the center of mass of this object moves with this kind of uh, average velocity sampled by all the beads which is just the same as the velocity sampled by the center of mass of this object because we are we are subcolmograph so this polymer feels a linear flow but the linear flow of course fluctuates in time as the polymer moves inside the turbulent fluid and then i have uh, brownian white noises to mimic thermal fluctuations acting on every bead so that's the equation for the center of mass so it's really a tracer motion with some uh, additional thermal diffusion which one can actually neglect uh, yes sir can i ask you few some questions yeah sure yes sir simple yes. questions so let's say this polymer with uh, n beads mm -hmm. so there will be a some force required to cut it i mean to break it right the first yes. thing yeah so let's call it f not so now we have two smaller springs maybe equal size mm -hmm. n by 2 n by 2 then to break them of course the smaller springs have higher stiffness yes in general okay spring i'm yes. talking about only spring yes yes so that will require larger force right so is the force kind of uh, follows the spring laws uh, yes yes so that's so i'll come to that in a second it's built into okay. the wavier modeling yeah oh, i see okay all right so what what we do is we take each link as 
something constant. And then if we make a molecule with more links, it automatically can stretch easier. And if you, if you break this molecule into two, it means each molecule will have fewer links, so it's harder to stretch. So that's how it comes into the model. So it will become clear in a second. Oh, so, okay. so if we come to the equation for Q, that is the uh, equation for each link. Right? So each link gets stretched out based on the velocity gradient here that acts to stretch it. This is the flow drag term. Uh, this is the relaxation due to the springs uh, from you know, either side. And this is the contribution of the white noise, which uh, the Brownian forces, which you know, at equilibrium, they set the equilibrium length of my molecule. But when you put it into the flow, the noises don't really matter. Okay, so let's come to this point now that uh, Menza just raised. So the issue is if we have uh, a polymer, I can represent it as a dumbbell or as a chain with n beats. So there has to be a way for me to map an n bead chain to an equivalent dumbbell, which would in some sense represent the overall polymer model. So this mapping was proposed by Jin and Collins in, a, in one of the early DNSs of such bead springs in turbulence. Uh, so what one does is relates the, this is now the equilibrium length in the absence of flow. So the kind of equilibrium length of the whole object can be related to the equilibrium length of every link, right? As the square root of the number of links. This is follows from the random walk theory of digits. Uh, the more important thing is how the time scale of the whole molecule, right? Or of an effective dumbbell that is used to represent the molecule. Uh, is related to the time scale of each individual link. So that follows this kind of relationship. So tau here on the right hand side is the time scale of each individual link, which is related directly to the time to the uh, force constant uh, of that spring. Okay, so that is what we keep constant throughout our simulations. The uh, the spring constant of uh, of each of these small links is the same. But now if I use ten of these links to build my molecule the time scale of the overall thing will go as 10 into 11. So roughly as 10 square. Whereas if I, if I break that now into two, I'll have two molecules with five links each. Each of them will have a corresponding smaller time scale, which is five into six times the time scale of each link. So you see that as this, if I start with a 10 bead uh, chain, as it breaks up, the daughters will automatically have smaller relaxation times or equivalently, they will be stiffer just by following this mapping. Uh, so where is this, where does this mapping come from? So what uh, Jin and Collins do is they use the random walk theory to get the equilibrium length of their effective uh, molecule. And then they use uh, an expression given by Wiest and Tanner, which is for the uh, extensional viscosity in an extensional flow. So if you take this chain and you stretch it out uh, I mean, you, you, you extend it with a strong extension, like in an extensional flow, you will get an expression for the infinite extensional viscosity. So that they enforce to be independent of this N. So in other words, you want your model, you want the chain model to give you the same extensional viscosity in a extensional flow, uh, regardless of the number of uh, links you use to represent it. So that is the basis of this mapping. So they originally used it as a way to compare, uh, you know, different number of chain, different uh, number of chain, uh, sorry, number of link models. But we are using the same idea here to build into our model the idea that as it as a chain breaks up, the daughter should have uh, stiffer effective uh, springs or shorter relaxation times. So building on the same idea, I can define the Weisenberg number of my whole molecule as this effective time scale of the whole molecule, right? Which is, uh, goes as number of links squared times the relaxation of each link, okay? So that's the effective time scale, elastic time scale, uh, multiplied by the Lyapunov exponent of the flow. The choice of Lyapunov exponent comes from previous studies in, of polymer stretching in DNS, which show that this is the best time scale to use to capture the coil stress transition. I'll show that in the next slide. So this is a good definition of the Weisenberg number, but really it boils down to a ratio of the effective relaxation time of my whole chain uh, to the time scale of the flow, which uh, here I take to be the inverse Lyapunov exponent, uh, which is for my flow is about 0.15 times the uh, inverse Kolmogorov time. Okay, so uh, I can then go to the flow 
So what we do is we study throughout, we are going to use homogeneous isotropic turbulence in a box. So I saw the Navier-Stokes equations uh, in a tri-periodic cube and uh, using standard pseudospectral methods. The, the forcing is done only at the large scales and uh, the energy cascades through and dissipates out through viscosity. And so we get a stationary state and I use these stationary flows and then I put my polymers into them and uh, yeah, track the behavior of the polymers. I'll talk about what happens when we feed back from the polymer stretching back onto the flow later on in the talk. Uh, so for these initial simulations, we have a modest Taylor Reynolds number of about 111. And uh, these are typical parameters. So what's important to remember now, so what I'm showing you here is a, is a snapshot of the uh, energy dissipation inside the flow, which is related to the local straining, the magnitude of the local straining. And the blue regions are where it's very strongly dissipative, about, I think, six times the mean, and the yellow is about four times the mean. So it's quite intermittent as a characteristic of turbulence. So now you can imagine if there's a polymer inside this flow and it's like kind of navigating its way through, sort of like a tracer, it will encounter regions of large straining and then maybe vertical regions, then again, regions of large straining and storm. So if you plot a time trace of the dissipation sampled by, the, uh, by such a polymer or you know the straining it feels locally, you'll see this very intermittent sort of uh, fluctuating strain. And this is what sets it apart from uh, polymers in laminar flows, where either you have a constant extension, like in an extensional flow, or if you have a shear flow, there is some dynamics, but it's still relatively simple. Uh, whereas here, we have a much more complex kind of history of strain. And that has implications for how the polymer stretches out. Okay, so let me talk about that uh, for a second. So as I mentioned earlier, the uh, uh, scission of polymers is well understood in laminar flows. But I said it's not understood in turbulence. So you can ask, you know, uh, what's the big difference between the two or why should it matter for scission? So this is a polymer in a laminar flow. And if you look at how it stretches out, right, as I increase the Weisenberg. So remember, increasing the Weisenberg is basically, uh, yeah, sorry, increasing the Weisenberg is taking a larger relaxation time. So the polymer is allowed to stretch more. So what I'm doing here is I do a simulation of a polymer inside such a extensional flow. It's actually bi-extensional. I take a five uh, bead chain and then I'm just plotting the probability distribution of the extension. So R is the end to end extension of that chain. Uh, so you see for small Weisenberg numbers, uh, they are basically all collapsed. They are all coiled. Okay. So the extensions are small. And then as you increase Weisenberg, they uncoil. Uh, what I want you to notice is the manner in which this uncoiling is happening. So for the way I have defined Weisenberg, 0.5 is the critical value across which there is this well-known coil stress transition. So 0.4, I'm below the transition, everything is coiled up. 0.8, I'm above the transition. And you see that the entire distribution shifts. So it remains a strongly peaked distribution. And then it shifts, uh, but it, the whole population of polymers stretches out together and moves in the R space. So you can see that the full group of polymers remaining strongly peaked is just shifting to larger and larger extensions. So you can imagine that if I had imposed a scission criteria that beyond some force or beyond some length, they're going to break. In a laminar flow, what happens is at low Weisenberg, nothing has broken. And as you go past the coil stretch, everything breaks very rapidly. But the behavior in turbulent flows is very different. So let me show you the same kind of probability distribution as I increase Weisenberg, but now in a turbulent flow. Uh, same number of beats. So uh, what you see is dramatically different, right? At uh, low Weisenberg, I have everything coiled. And then as you increase Weisenberg, the distribution broadens out uh, so dramatically that you, in fact, cannot see it properly on this linear scale plot. So I will show you the same plot on a log linear scale. So only the probability axis is now in a logarithmic scale. Uh, just so that you see how it's spreading. So what you can see now is that the as you increase Weisenberg, you actually get a very broad distribution, right? That is dramatically different from the lamina case. And that distribution broadens out. And ultimately, uh, at uh, large enough Weisenberg, the peak shifts from uh, coil state to the fully extended state. Of course, these are Fenet springs. So there is a maximum extension. So you have a peak at the max extension. Uh, so what I want you to notice is the very different sort of coil stress transition. 
Uh, this is the same plot in log log where you can see that there are actually power law tails. So uh, even at small Weizenberg, there is a power law tail. The exponent of the power law increases and then the power law flips and you ultimately have a peak at max extension. Uh, Jason, uh, in terms of time scales, Weizenberg number is the ratio of uh, this elastic stretching time scale to the inertia time scale, advection yeah. time scale. Yeah, to the time scale of the flow. So in my case, it's the uh, Lyapunov uh, exponent. So it's the yeah the time scale at which uh, two neighboring points in the flow stretch out. Right, they stretch out exponentially quickly. Okay. So that uh, the coefficient of that exponential stretching at asymptotic times is like my Lyapunov time. So that's what I am using. Uh, that gives me the best, cleanest coil stress transition. But you could even just use the Kolmogorov time scale tau eta. That also, I mean, it's fine. Okay, so in the limit of Weizenberg zero, it should be like a homogeneous isotropic. Yeah, it should just be a, 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 a rigid bead, like a tracer. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. And as you increase Weizenberg, it this becomes more and more stretchable. And the nice thing is that there is this sharp transition. Uh, I mean, it's sorry, it's sharp for laminar flows. It's not so sharp for turbulent flows, but it can be defined in terms of this. This, in fact, when the when the exponent of this power law. Uh, goes beyond minus one, I mean, becomes smaller than minus one is when traditionally it has been defined as coil stretch. But you can yeah, see so, the, yeah. Ex, yeah, the, ex, the power law goes from a negative exponent to a positive exponent. Right? So that is how the thing stretches up. So, so far, we don't have uh, the back reaction of the polymer on the floor. No, no, no back reaction and no scission. I'm just no, uh, no scission. Okay, yeah, thank I'm you. Just showing yes. you how, yeah. So, the main take home message here is that in turbulent flows, they stretch out. The dynamics is very different from lamina, which is why we need to like study scission separately. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, now let's come to modeling scission. So what I do is uh, in the context of my model, remember I have these individual springs between beads, which represent links, right? So each of them can stretch out independently and uh, I can therefore have a different force acting on every link. And in the context of my Fene model, the force on a link is one to one related to the local extension of that link, right? The QI. Uh, so I can just put a length based criteria because for me, it is the same as a force criteria. And so what I do is in my simulations, if any link is stretches beyond a threshold length, which I call L scission, uh, then I break the uh, chain at that location. So that link is broken and the remaining fragments are taken as dots. And uh, I, what I've done, I do is I set the scission length to be 80% of the maximum length inside the Fene force law. But the, these things, I mean, it's not sensitive to these details, the calculations. Uh, so I hope this point is clear. So essentially, I have these uh, chains in my flow, and all, every link stretches out differently. And when any 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 of the links reaches the critical length, I break it, and that is equivalent to saying it's reaching a critical force. Uh, so uh, there are, of course, more advanced scission models developed for, especially in laminar flows, they've been applied. But uh, for now, we just use the simple uh, law. And uh, the nice thing about this chain is it does allow us to include things like hydrodynamic interactions amongst the beads, extruded volume interactions, etc. And I'll talk about it in a little bit if I have time later. Okay, so let's start with the first uh, scission event. So what I'm going to do now is look at polymers which are not feeding back on the flow. So they are, I'm only looking at the consequence of the flow stretching on the polymer. And I want to look at just the first time the polymer breaks, because that in a sense marks the onset of this degradation of the polymer. Okay, so the nice thing about focusing on that is I can actually do some analytical calculations. So uh, what we do is we replace the entire chain with just a dumbbell. Uh, we replace the uh, Finney spring with just a linear Hokkien spring. And finally, we replace a turbulent flow with a Krikenen stochastic flow, which means I just use a Gaussian random velocity gradient. Okay, so, uh, so the uh, polymer just experiences this Gaussian fluctuating uh, velocity gradient. Then I can write a Fokker Planck equation for the probability distribution of the extension. So that's the equation. It's just like a diffusive type equation for the uh, probability distribution. And it has a drift term and a diffusion term with uh, coefficients that depend on the Weizenberg number, as you'd expect. Uh, so, and then how do I enforce scission? That comes into the boundary condition. So at the origin, I put reflecting conditions and because the probability cannot be negative. 
and at the decision length i set the probability to zero so anything that reaches that length is just removed from the simulation because it breaks up so this problem actually turns out to be self adjoint uh with orthogonal eigen functions and these calculations were done uh, by dario uh, so uh, the nice thing is you can then write that the uh, number of polymers surviving in my simulation so if np not is the initial thing i start with the number of polymers at any time is obtained just by integrating the probability distribution right from zero to the decision length and because i can solve the probability distribution in terms of orthogonal eigen functions i can just take the leading eigen function which will have the smallest uh, time scale right so that will give me the asymptotic behavior so all the other eigen functions will decay faster and the long time behavior will just be given by one term and so from that i can actually predict that the number of polymers surviving unbroken is going to decay exponentially with a decay time which is just the eigen value corresponding to the leading eigen function so uh, that that's a nice thing that we get from this uh, theory so i will now compare that thing with the numerical results so these are now results i do a full dns uh, with 10 bit chains so i'm not using a dumbbell the theory is for the dumbbell the simulations are with 10 bit chains and i use something like uh, close to a million uh, polymers uh, so these are now numerical results so what we see is that it indeed does decay exponentially with a time scale which we can extract that we call td and as the weisenberg numbers increased you see that the dk time increases or sorry the dk time uh, reduces time scale reduces or the polymers break up faster so from a very slow dk rate you start breaking up very quickly as the weisenberg is increased is there a question okay so uh, remember the coil stress transition is at 0.5 for me the critical weisenberg so you see that below 0.5 and as you go across 0.5 there is a a uh, dramatic speed up in the rate of scission right which corresponds to this idea that there is a transition around 0.5 and if i extract out the uh, time scales from here and plot them you see that there is in indeed a uh, rapid decay in the uh, time scale for scission so things start breaking very fast once you cross the coil stretch okay so i can also look at the uh, distribution of the extensions Uh, this is something. So this whole process is non-stationary, right? Because things are breaking up all the time. So uh, what we could do is look at the time-integrated PDF of the extension. And the nice thing is, from the analytical theory, you can predict uh, the power law. You can predict how it will behave. And uh, so basically, that it has a power law tail that goes as minus one minus beta, and the beta depends on the Weisenberg. And that's also what we see in simulations. Uh, so this the small r behavior is just dominated by thermal fluctuations it goes as r square as predicted in the theory and then at large extensions it has an exponent that goes as minus 1 minus beta uh, and the beta as, as weisenberg increases the beta goes to zero that's what you see in the inset so that ultimately it asymptotes to an r to the minus 1 behavior so at large weisenberg the scission keeps breaking up polymers fast and so that the you know uh, pdf attains this minus 1 b so this is all to just show that the uh, simulations kind of correspond well to the theory just based on you know a kraken flow and a dumbbell and that gives us some confidence in the simulations also and uh, okay i can also look at the uh, the time uh, so if i that was all based on distributions over the population i can also look at an individual polymer and see how long it takes to undergo the first breakup so that i call scission scission time and uh, if i look at the distribution of that it looks like a poisson distribution uh, with exponential tails and that sort of i think goes well with the fact that you do have an exponential decay of the number of polymers and you can extract out time scales from there i won't spend much time on this uh, Uh, okay, so this was this is just we tried to see whether this mapping actually works. Uh, so I do the simulation with different number of beads. So I take a dumbbell, uh, four beads, six beads, and so on till ten beads, and then I use the same mapping. So all of them are, are given the same uh, overall time scale, and then I calculate the time scale of links based on this mapping. 
so you see that using this mapping, I can, um, they all sort of give me similar behavior in the statistics at least, except at the end of the distribution. And this small deviation at the end turns out to be important for the decay rate. So if you look at how polymers decay, you see that the dumbbells decay slower than the 10 bead chains, even though they're supposed to represent the same molecule. Uh, but it does seem to converge. So the message here is you can use a dumbbell to represent a polymer molecule if you want a simple simulation. Uh, you will get everything qualitatively correct, but quantitatively you will have some issues. So you need to actually take you know, a chain if you want to get the quantitative, quantitative things uh, more accurately. Uh, there are, of course, some things that you cannot get with a dumbbell. One thing is to find out where exactly in the polymer molecule the breakup event happens. So if you have a dumbbell, by default, it is like a midpoint breakup. And most places in the literature, people have reported midpoint breakups. Uh, but here, uh, because we have a chain, we can actually look at where it breaks up. So these are histograms of the breakup location. Okay, So this is the link number. I use a 10-bit chain, so from 1 to 9 are my link locations. And you see that at modest Weisenberg, almost everything is breaking up at the center. That agrees well with uh, experiments in laminar flows. Uh, but you see at as the Weisenberg increases, which means you can think of this as the Reynolds number getting larger because the uh, time scale of the flow is getting smaller, right? Or the gradients in the flow are getting stronger. So as that happens, uh, there are more off-center breakups. So that means you have a wider distribution in the surviving daughter polymers. So you can expect to get broader distributions as you increase the uh, strength of the flow. Okay, so uh, I'll quickly talk about uh, this point also. So everything so far was with chains that uh, uh, have basically no uh, hydrodynamic interactions. In other words, the beads don't see each other. They can just overlap. And there are no extruded volume interactions either. Uh, but in uh, the laminar flow community, especially these two are, are known to play an important role for predicting things like the overall solution viscosity and, and so on. So we wanted to incorporate it just to see whether it has any qualitative impact. So I include uh, hydrodynamic uh, interactions between the beads using the R. I also put in uh, a Gaussian repulsive potential to mimic extruded volume uh, interaction. Uh, so uh, in a nutshell, what happens is uh, that things change quantitatively, but not qualitatively. Uh, so if you look at the red line, this is like my earlier results. There are no hydrodynamic interactions or extruded volume. Then if you compare the red and the green line, the green line does have a hydrodynamic radius for the beach. So it does have hydrodynamic interaction, but no extruded volume. And what you see is that with hydrodynamic interactions, the uh, polymers break up at a slower rate. Uh, the reason this happens is uh, you can get some insight here. So here I'm plotting the end-to-end -end extension for one particular polymer uh, with time. And you see that in the red case, which has no interactions, the uh, uh, polymer uncoils faster. Uh, whereas because I'm starting in a coil state, that is my initial condition, I start uh, it at the equilibrium extension, which is small. So this initially coiled polymer, the beads are very close to each other. And the hydrodynamic interactions actually prevents it from uncoiling. So it takes a longer time to uncoil when it experiences the flow and that delays the process of uh, uncoiling and ultimately scission. So that's why on average you have kind of a slower rate of decay when you account for the hydrodynamic interaction. Uh, but extruded volume does the opposite because it causes the polymer to kind of swell out. So it, the blue curve decays a little faster than the green because I put in extruded volume. Uh, so anyway, these things are only important at when you you know when you want to compare to a specific molecule and you try to fit these things, uh, you can get the time scale of decay more accurately. But qualitatively, nothing really changes. Okay, so this brings me to the end of the all of this was just discussing the first scission event. So uh, now let me uh, uh, talk a little bit about what happens after that. Right. So uh, the first scission is fine if you just want to track the on. When, when does degradation first set in? But if you want to know a kind of asymptotic question, right? so let's say I put my polymers in a flow and I keep stirring this fluid in a turbulent fashion. Ultimately, uh, things will stop breaking once the polymer fragments become so stiff that they are no longer stretched. Right? And the, I can ask a question of what is the final distribution of polymers that I have? 
So that sort of question to answer that I need to have uh, a chain which is allowed to break repeatedly and ultimately attain some kind of uh, stationary configuration. So to do that, uh, I account for multiple decisions. So I not only track the first decision, but I allow for these daughters to survive in the flow and then undergo repeated breakups. And the final possible state would be where I only have beads, but you know, larger polymers could survive depending on the Weisenberg number of the starting pair. So if I, if my original flow is a little weak so that the original Weisenberg number is not so large, then maybe it will only break up one or two times. But if you have a very strong flow so that the original parent polymer has a large Weisenberg, then it might break up all the way to just beads, which will never stretch of course. Okay, so uh, uh, I'll skip these implementation details. The basic idea is that I'm, I, uh, you know, uh, track, instead of tracking the polymers now, I track the beads uh, in the flow. So I solve equations for the motion of the beads, which are constant in my simulation. And what I keep updating after every decision is how the beads are linked to each other. So it's kind of a different way of looking at the simulation. And the most important thing here is uh, this mapping once again, right? So remember tau is the constant elastic time scale of every link that is kept constant, but the overall effective time scale of the molecule depends on this formula, right? So that's what I call tau daughter. So let's say I have 10 beats. The original time scale is uh, 111 by six tau. And if this breaks one so that I have two five beat chains, that means n is now five. So I have correspondingly smaller effective time scales, which I call tau daughter. So in this way, with every breakup, you get a daughter molecule, which has a smaller time scale or in which is harder to stretch, right? And it's correspondingly harder to break up. So that's what allows me to finally stop breaking up uh, in a natural way. Uh, so the, of course, when you have n equal to one, I just define the tau to be zero because the beat cannot stretch. So in a sense, the limit of our simulation depends on the number of beads I started with. Okay, so uh, what? So let me start here. So if I take a small, wi naught is the Weisenberg of my parent polymer. Uh, so if I start, I'm showing you results now for 0.8 and uh, the different colors correspond to a different number of beads in the daughter fragment. So the black line is the full parent polymer, which has 10 beads. So you see that right from the initial time, it starts to break and shows exponential decay. And as it breaks, it produces daughters of different sizes. So the red line corresponds to a five bead that probably happened because of a midpoint decision. Uh, this uh, purple line corresponds to three beads and two beads and so on. So there is a distribution of daughters, but none of the daughters are breaking up. So that means the Weisenberg wasn't large enough, right? Or the flow wasn't strong enough. I then increase the Weisenberg number and you see nothing much has changed. Still nothing is breaking up beyond the first decision. But now you go even higher and you start to see that the five beads, which are the red line, they also show a, uh, a breakup. So there's an exponential decay and they form even smaller daughters. So you see that uh, the two beads and three beads are growing even at the end of my simulation because the five beads are still breaking. That's the first point. The second point is notice compare the decay rate of the parent black polymer and the red daughter five bead polymer. So you see that the parent polymers are breaking much faster than the smaller daughters. So this is consistent with what Mahindra was asking that as they break, they become harder to undergo subsequent decisions, right? So that is accounted for naturally in that in the model. And so this uh, daughter polymers break up much slower. And then uh, the few guys that do break up and form dumbbells, for example, the dumbbells, which are the blue line are not breaking up at all. They are just accumulated. And a higher Weisenberg number, the same thing repeats, even more of the daughters break up and only the dumbbells seem to not break up anymore. And if I go to higher Weisenberg, ultimately I just get only beats. So that picture seems intuitive enough. Uh, so now I can try to, can I, the question is, can I estimate uh, which daughters survive? So in the first case where Weisenberg is 0.8, uh, anything smaller than five beads are all surviving. So five beads and everything smaller do not break. But when I have Weisenberg of the original parent to be four, you see that everything breaks except for a dumbbell. So how can I, can I estimate this a priori? So you can using this mapping. So uh, using that mapping for tau on the previous slide, right? For tau daughter, 
I can relate the Weizenberg of a daughter polymer to the Weizenberg of the parent as a ratio of the number of beads in the parent to the number of beads in the polymer. This just follows for my time scale map. And I can, if I can estimate the Weizenberg of any daughter with n beads, I can ask whether that daughter Weizenberg is less than the coil stress transition. If it is less, then I will say it survives. If it is more, then I expect that it would break up. So that is sort of my criteria for estimating this. And so I can now use this information in two ways. So let's say I, I, I am going to say that I have a parent of 10. So I have a, my parent has 10 beats. That is the uh, situation in all these plots. Okay. So N naught is 10. And then I want to know for a five beat daughter, right? N equal to five in this formula and N naught is 10. Uh, will this break if W I naught is greater than 1.83? So my, I do, I do know, I mean, that's what I've done. I've, I've uh, fixed n equal to five. Uh, I fixed uh, n not equal to 10. I have said w i equal to half. So that, because that is the threshold and I calculated w i not. So what I know is if the parent polymer has a Weisenberg greater than 1.83, the five bead will definitely break. And that's what you see here, right? Uh, if Weisenberg is 0.8 or Weisenberg is one, the five bead does not break. That is a red line. But the, if the Weisenberg is two, of the parent, which is greater than this threshold, the five beats do break. So this thing does seem to work. I can also do the reverse, right? I can take a parent polymer with Weizenberg four, and I can say that uh, the a four bead daughter will break only if the, um, sorry, for a four bead polymer, the Weizenberg is uh, greater than half, so it will break. So you can see here the orange curve does show breakup. But a dumbbell daughter polymer, right, with n equal to two, that Weizenberg is going to be less than half and it won't break. And that's also what we see in the simulations. So basically, this formula based on the time scale is able to predict the final surviving daughter as well. So, why is that important? That's important because it allows me to make a comparison with a nice experiment uh, by Vanapali et al. in the PNAS in, back in 2006. So, once again, you see the experiments are you know, quite a bit earlier. So what, what these authors did is they looked at uh, uh, various rheometers geometry. So this is a cross slot. This is a contraction expansion type situation. And they pushed the flow rates to high Reynolds numbers so that they get turbulent flow and they verified that they have turbulent flow with PID, et cetera. And then what they do is they put polymers into this flow uh, in, in dilute amounts. And uh, they, put, they put in the polymers they collected at the outlet and they cycle the same solution back. So they keep cycling the same polymers again through, through the system until the, uh, and they keep measuring the molecular weight distribution. And they repeat this until things stop changing. So in other words, they allow the polymers to break and degrade, and then they get the final surviving polymer distribution. And they, they measure that weight average molecular mass, which they relate to a kind of contour length of the polymer, which is in some, uh, it's just a, another way of measuring the mass of the surviving polymer. And they plot that versus the Reynolds number, and they get this very nice scaling. So uh, for us, we can interpret the Reynolds number like the Weizenberg, because as the Reynolds number increases, my Kolmogorov time scale will decrease, my uh, Lyapunov exponent will uh, will increase, and so my Weizenberg number should increase. So what they see is that the uh, mass of the surviving polymer decreases with Reynolds number. That qualitatively is what I showed you in the previous slide, right? So higher Weizenberg of the parent will lead to smaller daughter fragments surviving. But can we get this scaling from our simulations? And you see that they've done this experiment for different geometries. This is cross slot contraction expansion. They've also done it in Taylor Kuwait, which is the green dots. And they all follow the same sort of scaling, which is interesting. I'll come on, comment on that in a second. OK, so can we estimate the scaling? So I start with my mapping. So this is the Weizenberg of the daughter polymer is related to tau of the links in the following fashion. Tau eta is the Kolmogorov time scale, right? This is just the mapping I used in the beginning. And this should be less than the coil stress transition for that daughter to survive. That is my starting point. So tau is the link of each, the time scale of each individual link, so which is, uh, yeah. So now for large n, this can just go as n square. And this Weisenberg critical is just a constant half. So basically, this tells me that the largest surviving daughter should have n square growing as tau eta divided by tau of each individual link. So this tau of each link is a constant, and tau eta can be related to the Reynolds number, right? By standard Kolmogorov phenomenology. 
So when I do that, I get n square goes as r to the minus three by two. And for me, n is a proxy for the number of links which can be related directly to their contour length l. So translated to the nomenclature of this experiment, it says n square goes as r to the Reynolds to the minus three by two, and that's exactly this line, the solid line. Okay, so uh, we do we are able to kind of explain the scaling of r e to the minus three by two observed in these experiments. Uh, now the nice thing about this is that this seems to be independent of the geometry, and the reason for this is that uh, is also connected to the fact that we have used Kolmogorov homogeneous isotropic phenomenology to relate tau eta to Reynolds number. Uh, the reason this works is because most of the scission happens in the bulk of these channel flows, not near the walls. So even though the velocity gradients are largest at the walls, the number of polymers are there are like very few, like less than ten percent. For uh, modest Reynolds number and for the highest Reynolds number, the buffer layer is so thin that it's less than one percent. So almost all the scission is happening in the bulk, where things are approximately homogeneous isotropic, and you can use, you know, Kolmogorov scaling. And in fact, this dashed line is the scaling you would get if you use the, if you try to use the shear rate at the wall to estimate uh, how L square, L square will go, and that gives you a different scaling which you see doesn't match the experiments. So in this particular case, at least the homogeneous isotropic turbulence calculations we have done does give you a useful result for the channel flow, right? Because it's dominated by what's happening in the bulk. Okay, so I'm uh, nearly done, uh, but towards the end, I just want to talk about uh, uh, what happens when we include feedback. So maybe I'll skip some of these things, then I can come back to it later. Uh, here we try to derive. Uh, A simple formula for how the time scale of the entire solution decays. So uh, uh, basically, I showed you how individual polymers are decaying. Right? But what I can do is I can say that my entire box ha is has a whole bunch of polymers, and is there a kind of average relaxation time for the whole volume that I can uh, estimate? So it turns out that at least for dumbbells, we can derive a simple formula for the decay time of the. Uh, uh, Polymers in the whole volume, and this is some kind of analytical formula that one could use, maybe in you know some simple heuristic calculations, uh, just to get an idea of the initial time scales or rate of decay. Uh, another interesting question related to the uh, daughter polymers is whether the daughter polymers uh, are different from the original parent in the sense, do they have memory uh, of the fact that they are you know formed by a as a daughter. So what I'm trying to what I mean is that if you take a 10 bead chain and it breaks up into two five beads, these five beads have a unique initial condition in that they have just formed from a high stretching event. So one would expect these five beads, these daughter five beads, to show a different uh, scission behavior than if I started a brand new simulation with five bead polymers, right? So that's what I mean by do daughter polymers have memory? If they don't have memory, then I don't actually have to do this hierarchical simulation. The statistics of Any of the daughters can be obtained from the statistics of a parent with the same number of beads. Uh, but what we see is that that is not really the case because if I look at the uh, distribution of time to scission, right? For uh, this black line is for parents. Uh, the the sorry the black line is for the original 10 bead polymer. The red line is the scission life scission lifetime. Uh, the lifetime of the daughter polymers with five beads. That's the red line, and the blue line is the lifetime distribution for five beads. If I started a brand new simulation with them, so the blue line are parents with five beads, the red line are daughters with five beads, and what you see is that there's a dramatic difference at early times. So the fact that these uh, daughters have been formed from a high scission event means that they are likely to undergo a repeated scission almost immediately. And you see that in the peak of this distribution, so many of them break up very quickly. Uh, but once you cross an initial time, they start to show the same exponential tail as do the parent polymers, which you know were put into a new simulation. And uh, this, this is so. This initial window is kind of the forgetting time scale. About ten uh, times tau eta is the time scale over which the daughters forget that their history, and that actually is close to the Lagrangian decorrelation time. You know that is known from uh, other simulations in in these flows. Okay, so let's finally come to now the loss of drag reduction. So I'm now going to include two-way coupling. 
So we want to account for the feedback of polymers back onto the flow and see if we can capture this loss of drag reduction. So to simplify things, I'm going to go back now only to a dumbbell. I'm no longer going to do chains because the dumbbell is hard enough. So I just take a dumbbell uh, and I account for the feedback of the dumbbell onto the flow uh, by introducing a polymer uh, tensor, TP. And this polymer tensor is calculated at every time by summing up the force contributions from the individual dumbbells in my simulation. So it's a hybrid Eulerian Lagrangian simulation developed by uh, Takeshi and uh, uh, Goto in this, in the details are in this GFM. Uh, so here Takeshi has done these simulations uh, uh, for us using the same idea, but incorporating now scission. So what he does is he has a bunch of dumbbells initially in the flow. As the flow evolves, the dumbbells get stretched and they exert a force back onto the fluid. This force is accounted for by, uh, by calculating the stress tensor. So basically, whenever you have a dumbbell, you have like a Dirac delta oriented force along the uh, vector and along the extension vector of that dumbbell. And then you average it over, a, over the computational grid, basically. So instead of, you can't use Dirac delta and the pseudo spectral simulation. So you do some averaging so that you get a smooth uh, stress tensor back. And uh, that is then put into the Navier-Stokes equation and appropriately it modifies the flow. Uh, the nice thing, of course, is that every individual dumbbell, you can follow its stretching. And so if it stretches beyond a threshold, we can break it. So we can apply the same precise scission criteria and uh, account for the feedback. So this simulation is much smaller. It's only Taylor Reynolds number 51. The reason is that uh, if we take a big box, we need a huge number of polymers to have this sort of feedback effect, right? So even for a relatively small Reynolds number, we already need almost a billion polymers. So uh, that already is quite uh, intensive. So that is one challenge of doing these hybrid Eulerian Lagrangian, which is why we want to ultimately try to see if we can incorporate scission into a continuum model. But for now, we are you know limited to doing scission at the individual polymer level. Okay, so let's look at finally these results. So first I'm just showing you how the number of now two-way coupled dumbbells decay in the flow. So the thin line is the uh, very dilute result corresponding to the passive case I showed you earlier. And the thick lines are what you get when it's more concentrated so that you have substantial feedback on the flow. Uh, and what you see, the long-time behavior is exponential, just like the passive polymers. But at early times, the sign of the two-way coupling is clear in that the original decay rate is much slower. Right? And why is this? This is because at the beginning, when there are lots of polymers, there is a drag dissipation reduction effect. So the effective dissipation uh, in the fluid is reduced at early times. That's what you see here. So at, I'm plotting now the kinetic energy dissipation uh, averaged over the volume right? to give you an idea of, uh, I mean, this is the kind of proxy for drag in our homogeneous isotropic uh, situation. So what you see is that uh, at early times, there is this reduction from the Newtonian value, the Newtonian value is 0.5. It's a solid line, the here, flat line. So there is a reduction uh, at early times uh, corresponding to the Weisenberg number. And uh, then with time, there is a degradation of the polymers and then you recover to the Newtonian dissipation value. Uh, and so because at early times you have a much weaker dissipation, you have weaker stretching rate, which is why the polymers also degrade more slowly. But eventually they do degrade sufficiently so that you know they lose this dissipation reduction effect. It becomes Newtonian in flow. And then the re remaining of the remainder of the polymer degradation becomes just like my passive simulations. So uh, the main point to notice from this second panel here is that uh, the large Weisenberg numbers, although they give you a stronger dissipation reduction at the beginning, compare the blue and red curves, for example. Uh, the large Weisenberg number case, which stretches out more, also breaks up faster, right? So it's like a trade-off. If you have a, uh, if you take a polymer molecule with a large relaxation time, it stretches more, which means you'll have a stronger dissipation reduction or stronger drag reduction, but it will also break up much faster so that the time duration for which that effect lasts is short. So if you want some kind of overall maximization, you need to have an intermediate Weisenberg number. So that is like a key take-home message from these simulations. Okay, so uh, I'll conclude with that. So the 
main message here is that uh, while we know that drag or dissipation reduction owes its origin to polymer stretching right it also meets its demise in polymer scission which follows from the fact that polymers are being stretched and so there is this inherent trade off in the phenomena which is why we say that an intermediate weisenberg actually maximizes the overall drag or dissipation reduction over time if you are you know interested in the overall effect uh, so what are some implications for what we have done for other flows so such scission would also be relevant for low reynolds number elastic turbulence because there also it's the phenomena is dependent on polymer stretching uh but there the turbulence is maintained by you know the polymer so if the polymer start to break the turbulence itself will decay uh, that's not the case in what i showed you today which is uh, you know uh, the fundamental turbulence is newtonian turbulence at the background so even though my polymers break the turbulence in fact get stronger whereas in elastic turbulence as polymers break the turbulence would get weaker so we expect quite different uh, dynamics there and that's something we want to explore later in the future Uh, of course, it would be nice to extend what we've done to channel flows, where most of the applications are there in drag reduction. And uh, one of the outstanding problems is to try to incorporate scission into continuum models so that you can, you know, model more uh, uh, more demanding problems. And that's really an open problem. And we want to use some of the insights we've got from our uh, Brownian dynamics DNS calculations to try and come up with uh, at least some initial continuum models. Okay, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm very happy to take questions. Uh, all details are out in a paper which came out earlier this year in JFM. Thank you. Yeah, so th thanks a lot, Jason. Uh, very interesting talk. So if there are any questions, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself.